Okay. Well, hello everybody. Um, <clears throat> I've met some of you here before. My name is a cup of tea here in Second Life or John O'Connor in the natural world. I'm a professor at the Technological University Dublin in Ireland and Magua and I have been jointly delivering this program for the last four years or so. I was due to have uh, students from Technological University Dublin, also known as TU Dublin, joining us um, this semester, but it seems like um, that's not going to come to pass. It's an optional module and I think um, the students have opted out this semester <laughs> instead of opting in. However, there are about three who are still swearing interest um, but whether or not they turn up is another matter. However, I am still going to um, be part of this delivery and I am going to be mentoring the purple team for the course of this semester. So that's me. Um, now I would like to introduce our two guest speakers today um, who are joining us at great expense. Saitar Madonna who you may have met already, um, has long been associated with this module in Second Life. Um, he, in fact, graduated from a similar module about 15 years ago and has the distinct honour of being the only person to score 100%. Since then, he has been delivering talks on team building um, and more recently on the nature and a definition of the metaverse. Our key speaker today is Val Librarian Greg, who also has been involved in teaching on this module for a long number of years. Uh, Val speaks largely about the topic of her publication, Meta Literacy. Um, she talks about literacy in the digital age and she also talks about digital citizenship. And of particular interest um, is that she looks at both the positive side of our dig digital world, but she is also very interested in the dark side of digital technology and the things that we need to be careful of and watch out for. So, and. Um... <clears throat> So welcome everyone to Digital Citizenship and Meta Literacy. Um, my name is Dr. Valerie Hill with the avatar name Val Librarian. I've been researching virtual environments now for over 15 years with a focus on changing literacy. As the information revolution turned literacy and our lives upside down. Currently, I'm the director of the Community Virtual Library right here in Second Life, which is a real library in a virtual world. And I'm the co-coordinator of the Virtual Worlds Education Consortium. Now, I'll put the website link in local chat. You don't need to look at that right now, but you can scroll up later. Any links that I drop in the chat, you can scroll through the local chat and find them to look at those later if desired. I have taught at all grade levels, first grade, fifth grade, um, elementary school, as well as college. I served as a school librarian for 20 years and then a college professor of information science. So I'm going to invite you to please follow me and we will walk over to my digital citizenship and meta literacy platform. So walk this way, please. I'm going to stop right here at the bottom of the ramp. <clears throat> Great. Good to see everyone walking over this way. I'll stop right here at the bottom of the ramp. Might move a little closer over here to my sign. Looks like everyone made it. 
So at the bottom of, of the ramp, you see a white placard sign with questions. These are the questions that we will address today. And if you click on the sign, you will find some definitions of the terms that I'm talking about, metaliteracy and digital citizenship. So please be considering these questions and be prepared to respond at the end when we have a discussion. The first question, what caught your attention about digital citizenship and metaliteracy? Anything at all, just what are you thinking about as I'm giving you this talk? And the second question, what are your thoughts about your future as a digital citizen? So keep those in mind, and we will talk about that at the end of our session. But right now, I'd like to ask you to follow me up the ramp, and you can stand up here on the ramp, and you can use your camera to zoom in on me through as I go through my slides. Zoom in on me to focus your attention, and you'll see that I'm sitting on my first slide, which has uh, an image of my book that John mentioned. The title is Meta Modernism and Changing Literacy. I'll put the link to my book in the local chat, and you can scroll up through the chat and click on that link later if you want more information about the book. This book addresses the challenges that we face due to the changes of digital culture, particularly on changing literacy. I believe it's now imperative that we each understand our personal responsibility as digital citizens. Changing literacy impacts us all. Each one of you avatars standing right there have been affected. There's now a need for a new look at literacy. And that's the word that we're talking about today, a word for the new way to look at literacy, meta-literacy. Literacy in digital culture requires juggling formats, both physical and digital. And that's why I've adopted this new term for new literacy. I'm going to jump over on my next slide. Alvin Toffler. He coined this word, this term, prosumer, when he, he was a futurist, and he began to see that individuals were beginning to create and share the content themselves. This is what we all call user-generated content, and I'm sure you have created some. He came up with this term way back in 1980 in his book, The Third Wave. With the internet, the information hierarchy toppled. And trust me, as a librarian, this really changed my work and my profession as information was turned upside down. We have far more user-generated content today than we do traditional media formats such as books. YouTube has become the number one source of information on the planet. We are both consumers and producers of media. It's two words, of course, a producer and a consumer, but if you put those two words together, you get a new word, a portmanteau, prosumer. So I'm gonna ask you all if you've ever posted any content online, if you've uploaded content, maybe on YouTube or another platform, Twitter, X, Instagram, Facebook, maybe you have a blog, a website, maybe you like to post on Pinterest or Twitch. Please type in the local chat if you have an online account where you upload some content, any account at all, Facebook, name the platform or the platforms that you use most often to upload content. Maybe just one, maybe, maybe several. LinkedIn, I'll type that one. Many educators use LinkedIn to focus on a particular topic in their profession. Anybody else have one they can type in local chat? 
And this doesn't have to be serious academic content. It can be sharing with your family. Great, I see Instagram, a blog, so many ways to share our own content and upload it online. Great, Instagram, X, keep typing if you think of one, and I'll jump over to this next slide that continues talking about Alvin Toffler. If you think of another online tool where you like to upload content, feel free to type it in the local chat. Now, Al Alvin Toffler has this famous quote, which I love because it really relates to changing literacy. Oh, and Vimeo, another way to share videos besides YouTube. There are so many places to share our own content. Listen to what Alvin Toffler had to say about how this changes literacy. He said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. There's no end to the incoming stream of information that we have every day on our digital devices, nor is there any end to the constant updates and upgrades of our hardware and new apps for us to use. There is no mastery of literacy anymore. It's a constant learn, unlearn, relearn. This constant oscillation, and note that word, oscillation. I use this word a lot because it's key to metamodernism. This oscillation is a swinging between production and consumption of media. A swinging between physical and digital formats. Right now in the real physical world, my two hands were swimming, swinging back and forth, left to right. Do that with your own hands. In the physical reality, back and forth with your hands. I need to get an animation for my avatar. This aligns, this swinging back and forth aligns to our philosophical moment, which I call meta-modernism. Many philosophers are beginning to adopt the name for our current era. We don't know for sure. It's hard to name a moment when you're in it, but time will tell. Acquiring knowledge in the past meant climbing the ladder toward final mastery. Not anymore. In most professions, in most things that we learn, we learn new tools and apps constantly while we're evaluating live information and adapting to new devices and software updates. So I repeat, there's no end to the incoming stream of information in which we all as digital citizens participate. Each one of us is personally responsible for our incoming and our outgoing information. So this is a huge change in literacy, which happened mostly around the turn of the century. Now a term that fits with this personal responsibility at any age, from really young children all the way to the elderly, is meta-literacy. Mackie and Jacobson in 2014 coined this term to, to help us better understand how we can be literate in digital culture as prosumers. This is essential to digital citizenship. Now you can find more about this at the metaliteracy.org website. Um, I shared a guest blog post there. You can look at this link later. As I mentioned, just scroll up later in the chat and go to these links to bookmark and look at them later on. You can see on the circle where I'm sitting, and I think you all know how to use your Alt and left mouse key to zoom in. So take your Alt key and your left mouse key, zoom in on the circle on this sign, zoom in real close, and you'll see the many different roles that we can have as a meta-literate learner or a meta-literate individual. I see participant. You're all participants right here today, participants in this lecture. You could be a communicator, a translator, 
I did translate my definitions into Turkish. You can be an author. You can be a teacher or a peer teacher to each other, a collaborator, a producer, a publisher, a researcher. All of those are part of being meta-literate. And this word has a model for how this works as we juggle all of the many formats. I mentioned that the internet revolutionized literacy. Well, it connected everyone. The internet gave everyone a voice through all of these ways we can upload and share and communicate. Yet, not everyone has anything meaningful to add to the conversation. There's a lot of clutter. The internet has become a flood of information that is impossible to navigate without embracing meta-literacy, whether you call it that or not. Once we understand what it means to be prosumers and participants in digital culture, unless you are a hermit way up in the mountains with no internet connection at all, we become aware of the need for digital citizenship. I said everyone has a voice online, but not everything shared is good or meaningful or true. In fact, Mackie and Jacobson believe that we now live in a post-truth world, which makes it very difficult to evaluate our information. I'm going to jump over on this colorful wheel on the next slide. The many elements of digital citizenship on this wheel are beyond the scope of this short talk today. Each one of these elements could be a presentation on their own. But they cover the ethical use of information, cybersecurity, safety, communication. They even cover emotional intelligence. As you look at this digital, digital citizenship wheel from the DQ Institute, I'm going to ask you to zoom in once again with your alt left click zoom and look at all the colors. This comes from the DQ Institute and I put the website in local chat for you to access later. Note, digital citizenship doesn't just mean don't be a bully. That's the first thing that comes to mind with people. Be nice, be a good citizen, don't be a griefer or a troll, but it's much more. Digital identity how you present yourself online and your avatar, digital rights, your personal right to privacy, digital lit literacy, critical thinking, content creation, which you're going to be doing in this class. It's part of digital citizenship. D emotional intelligence, digital security, safety, and use, all of these that you're looking at are all part of digital citizenship. Now, I said I'm the director of the Community Virtual Library. We built a digital citizenship museum in the virtual world of Kitely. There are many virtual worlds across the metaverse besides Second Life. This one is our main home, but in Kitely we have other um, educational, serious content. And as the support library for the Virtual Worlds Education Consortium, We've branched out to other virtual worlds besides Second Life. You can find out more about that on our website as well. At the VWE Consortium website slash communities, scroll down and you'll see that we're branching out across the metaverse. And if you click on the library on the left side of the web page, you'll see a calendar of live help available at our info center here in Second Life. John? right here, one of your professors, helps out there at the Info Center. A lot of collaboration in Second Life and other virtual worlds for learning. Because we cannot possibly all be experts in all of these elements of digital citizenship, such as communication, privacy, or cybersecurity. But together, we can be aware, and we can find experts to help us 
within these various fields. We have an expert in cybersecurity who helps us here in Second Life. As the metaverse evolves and the new technologies like artificial intelligence advance. I'm going to jump over here on this slide that shows you the rocks all balanced because balance is critical. Literacy has become a balancing act. Use your alt zoom and zoom in on the rocks and you'll see some of the different ways, the different things we have to balance um, as we're becoming meta-literate. I told you I was a school librarian for 20 years and during that time, it was crazy. I witnessed the close of the Gutenberg parentheses. I'm going to pull out a slide right here to show you that. I don't, I don't want to lose you here, so just watch. I'm going to pull a slide out right here on the fly. Gutenberg parentheses. Okay, zoom in. Anybody know what that image is right there? If you do, you can type what you think it is in the local chat. The Gutenberg press. It came to the forefront in about the year 1500 and mainstream. Everyone was, had access to print. Prior to that, only the monks and the scribes had access to print materials. If you zoom in, you can see that that's actually a page from the Bible, from the Gutenberg Bible, um, and it was printed on the Gutenberg Press. Well, I'm going to type this in local chat. 1500, that's the Gutenberg Press. It closed in about the year 2000. The parentheses closed, and by that what I mean is print is no longer king. That was a parenthetical time period of 500 years where the printed word was king of the information hierarchy, and that ended during my time as a librarian. That was a pretty important moment to me. <laughs> it ended. It has ended. Print is no longer king of information. No more encyclopedias. I used to order them in my library. They're gone. No more dictionaries. Well, you can turn pages in a dictionary if you want to, but it's much faster to Google it. A fourth grader taught me that. <laughs> so how many of you still enjoy reading a book in print? And great, you're going to get to talk about this ne next week with John. What happened after print? I'm going to type a big Y in, in local chat. Type a Y if you still like books. Turning the pages, feeling the pages. I still love print books, and they're still going to be around. Even though the Gutenberg parentheses have closed, print is still a great format. But we have to be aware that it's not the main format. I love print books. They'll most likely always be around, but now we, more often, we use ebooks, websites, databases, videos, podcasts, blogs, and apps, 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 apps. Millions of apps. Juggling all these tools, sometimes simultaneously, it's actually changing the human brain. Our brains are changing. Um, there's a woman who wrote this book. Dear Reader, Come Home. Her name is Marianne Wolf. She documents research of our changing brains. The, all this juggling, it's a meta-literacy skill. And it's a part of digital citizenship. Because one can get sucked away by the stream of social media into a self-absorbed whirlpool, which is very difficult to get out of, more on the dark side of digital culture in a few minutes. But not only must we learn to juggle and choose the best digital tools, we also juggle between worlds, physical, virtual, or augmented. So choosing the best space for a specific purpose, whether it's working or gaming or social interaction, learning, that's also a meta-literacy skill. This juggling and this oscillation back and forth. I'm going to type in chat the name of that book in case anybody wants to look for it later. 
Dear Reader, Come Home by Mary Ann Wolf. She says that the children growing up now learning to read are forming a biliterate brain, which can easily switch from print in the physical world to online, digital, and virtual environments. They're ready for the metaverse. New platforms are emerging constantly with virtual reality headsets, 360 degree videos becoming mainstream. I'm part of a team of educators and, and Sidearm does this as well. We go out and it explore many virtual environments either with or without headsets just to see how the metaverse is evolving. A major goal of the virtual, the community virtual library is to bring together digital citizens to share best practices for becoming metaliterate. And we have tools to help accomplish that goal. Many ne networking opportunities. For example, we're working on a virtual worlds database and uh, we support, as I mentioned, the virtual worlds education consortium. And all of this as an avatar. I'm going to sit over here on this avatar slide. Zoom in and see my question. What does it mean to be a live avatar in the metaverse versus being a live being in the real physical world? And you can see my avatar photo and my image uh, in the physical world. Well, hmm. on, our online identity requires us to be digital citizens. So to answer that question, what it means to be an avatar in the metaverse, I consider myself to be the same in both. That's why I put the word librarian in my name. I, I'm here for that reason, and I'm the same in both worlds. Yet, I know that in the metaverse, many people are gamers, and they like to play character roles. And that's not being their real self. You can be someone else. You can be a character. And many of the kids growing up like to use that word character. So I'm kind of starting to think I like avatar when it's me. Character when it's maybe a role play in a game, although I'm not a gamer. But here in this class, I'm going to cam out to see all of you standing here, you avatars. We're all embodied as avatars. Each one of you is a real live human being. Embodied in an av avatar with a sense of presence in a virtual space that's still real, even though virtual. And some of you are thousands of miles away from each other in the physical world. And yet we could be together right here, creating a real memory. So I don't want to lose your attention here. I'm, I'm giving you a lot of content about meta literacy and digital citizenship. I'm going to jump up and ask you to follow me just to make sure you're focusing on, on what I'm talking about. Follow me back over to my first slide and gather real close together because you can see we're all we're all embodied avatars. But if you're just at your keyboard, you're just zooming in on something, you could we could just be on Zoom or something else. Gather real close around this first slide. I'm gonna sit back up here. All right, everybody's getting closer over here. And I'm zooming in on all of you avatars, real people moving about in this space. Now, watch me, because I'm going to fly over to my next slide. To talk about our philosophical moment. I'll sit up here, and you can zoom in on the slide. Yes. The information revolution has changed literacy forever. There's no going back. We live in a really fascinating, fast-paced time, no matter what it's called. Personally, I've adopted the term metamodernism in discussion of our current philosophical era. Postmodernism is over. And you can zoom in on this slide and see early 1900s. That was, that was modern times. Mid, mid to late 1900s, postmodernism. 
a lot of irony, tear, tearing down everything, tearing down the grand narratives. That's over. Now we're in metamodernism. Although there are other names for this in the running, some philosophers are calling it post postmodernism. I think that sounds rather redundant. Some are calling it hyper modernism. I um, I personally like metamodernism um, because think about this. I present this topic today here in the metaverse, a place where metadata constructs constructs us simulation of reality. Think about that. We're standing right here as avatars inside a metaphor of the world. And as you think about that, you, each one of you, you're thinking, you're using metacognition. That means thinking about thinking. That prefix meta means about or beyond. About, about, about. Everything seems to be about Meta, meta, meta. So yes, I think we've become meta-modern, and it's certainly time to become meta-literate. Now, this might not make sense, but type an M in the local chat if you're beginning to realize there's a lot of meta going on. <laughs> meta, 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 and meta-literacy aligns to this. So type an M. I think we all agree there's a lot of meta in our lives. And I'm not going to even say anything bad about Facebook changing their name to that because no one company can own the metaverse. Classrooms have changed. And we have learning environments that oscillate, as I mentioned, swing back and forth between the physical and the virtual world. So look at this, look at this slide and zoom in at that black and white photo at the top left. The students there all sitting rigidly in, in rows of desks. I bet that's not where you're sitting right now. I bet that's not what your class looks like. Now we have XR, extended reality, multiple realities where we can learn, create in new ways, and this impacts literacy. With so many tools for learning, both physical and virtual, we each become responsible for our attention, for our focus. If, you, if you're zooming in on that slide, you see educators in VR. We have, to, we have to decide where we're going to look because we have so many places to go to learn, virtual and physical. This is certainly part of meta-literacy and part of digital citizenship. You're responsible for it. We work on a variety of tools for various purposes, for various projects which you'll do right during this class. And the augmented reality picture, you can see using a digital device to, to link between physical objects and virtual ones. So many ways that we can learn beyond the physical world. Yet how to archive these digital spaces and objects this can present a serious problem for the future. Look at this slide. All right, preservation of literacy formats. Look at these objects. Would you type a P if you recognize any of them? I see an old cassette tape. Some of you have maybe never ever <laughs> seen one of those. We don't really listen to our music on cassette tapes anymore. P for preservation, I'm going to type one. And does anybody recognize the, any of the other objects? A floppy disk? I don't have a computer that takes that anymore. Yes, a VHS tape. Now we have our videos live streamed from our streaming sites, or we, um, we upload them to YouTube. We have MP4s. Some people may still use DVDs, but a lot of people don't even have a DVD player anymore. Look at the top left. The Dead Sea Scrolls on the top left can still be read after thousands of years. They carefully brush away the dust and they unearth those. But if we don't figure out how to migrate our digital data from formats that are changing, they could be lost forever. 
not only is are these formats, the physical formats changing, VHS tapes, and the digital formats changing, but so is the hardware. If you don't have the hardware to read it and it's obsolete, it's lost forever. Right now, our current formats, uh, how many of you are familiar with MP3s or streaming your music, type of Y? MP3s, that's probably the main format for music because it, it balances, you know, loss of, of data with, you know, the size of the file. Everyone likes MP3s, but that's going to change. MP4s are currently popular for videos, JPEGs or PNG for images, but these are all changing. And so too is the hardware that we need to access them. Organizing our digital content on our devices or in the cloud, it's not always easy. For example, I remember <clears throat> as a little girl finding an old photo album of my great grandmother's and turning the crackling black pages and, the, and touching the pictures that were faded and yellow. It was fascinating to see their old clothes, the long dresses and the fancy hats and touch that old print. But with digital photos, will our great grandchildren find our family pictures and realize how old they are? They're all, they all look brand new in digital form. Do any of you print out pictures and put them into albums? Photos are just one format. There are hundreds of file, digital file extensions, and they're all evolving. And now most content is what I like to say, born digital. It, it just, the first time it's ever comes out, it's in a digital format, not in print, not in something tangible, but born digital. And it's important that we figure out how to preserve it before it's lost. This too is part of meta literacy, and this could be a topic for another presentation, digital archival. This is a really important topic to me, and I really want to do a presentation on it because it, it impacts all of us with, with our photos and our music. My daughter-in-law is a jazz musician. She loved having CDs and records, vinyl albums, because she could find them and touch them. And now she finds it so hard to find her music because it's, it's invisible. Digital formats are invisible, invisible to us. So that's a topic to consider. Have you organized your photos? <laughs> so as you can see, I've adopted this term metamodernism. And I'm continuing my research on changing literacy and how the metaverse can be used for learning. That's why I'm here talking with you today. You are part of my research. I'm panning out now just to look at all of you. Your students, we're learning, we're pioneers in learning. A lot of people have never learned in the metaverse. So I'm continuing this research and the next generation will see the metaverse evolve. And my hope is that they will embrace digital citizenship, meaning they will know that they are personally responsible for it. We'll see in the future if the term metamodernism is adopted as the best name for our current era. I believe we live in a rapidly changing time, and this name for our time seems to fit. Now, type a Y in the local chat if, if you agree that we may be living in metamodern times you get this sense of feeling that things are different than they were in the last century. And that makes us want to think about why is it different and what's the name for it? I do have some references for you, a few right here on this final slide. And I hope that all of you will ponder your own responsibility for digital citizenship. And I hope you'll think critically about your own changing literacy. So meta literacy, you've got the definitions in the white sign at the bottom of the ramp. It's simply a term to address literacy as prosumers. Meta literacy is literacy in the digital age. There it is in Turkish. 
And digital citizenship is the safe, responsible, and ethical use of technology for communication in global digital participa participatory culture. And that's where we live. That's where we spend most of our time. If you click on the blue box, and I'll jump down and stand by it, if you click on the blue box right here in front of me, you can get more information about my book, some note cards, if you're interested in learning more about metamodernism and changing literacy. Now remember, I said there's a dark side to digital culture. Well, I'm going to take you there so that we can contemplate some of the issues that we face. Perhaps you've seen some of the dark side already. And maybe some of this will be very familiar to you. I'm going to res a transporter for us to teleport to the dark room. You're going to click on the black circle right here in front of you. When you touch the black teleporter, we will drop through the black hole <laughs> into the digital dark side. And I will meet you there. Great, everyone's arriving. I'm going to ask you to find a, sorry if I bumped you there, ask you to find a bean bag and take a seat. I'm going to use my camera and cam way out. I can see if I cam way out, I'm inside a great black dark room. I see a couple more people over there on the on the platform that need to touch the teleporter. And then we're all here. We made it to the dark side of digital culture. Hopefully everybody's finding a bean bag. You can use your camera to find me and zoom in where I'm sitting up here by my slide, the dark side of digital culture. Online on the internet, each one of us has a personal dash dashboard. It's personal, we create it ourselves. It's our dashboard of incoming information. And that's unlike libraries of the past where we went to find information and we had gatekeepers providing us with content that had jumped through hoops for accuracy, authority. But we don't have gatekeepers anymore. <laughs> We're the gatekeepers. That's our personal responsibility. So what's a personal dashboard? You have one. You get to decide what apps are on your phone, what apps are on your devices. You get to design your color schemes on your device. You get to put your personalized wallpaper, maybe a picture of family or your favorite color or season. You design your device. It's personally yours. And you design what goes in it and where you get your information. It's great, but it's also a big problem because evaluation of all the incoming information on our devices is extremely difficult. As I said, everyone has a voice, but not everything they say is good, meaningful, or true. So all this information is coming to us, and we don't have any idea where most of it comes from. You'll see there are other problems on the slide, and I'm going to jump over here in a minute to pan over to the one next to me on my left. Too much information. Maybe you've felt that way. Your head is just spinning in a cloud, and now it actually can be in the cloud. The information stored in the cloud. See the information, the slide on too much information? Do you sometimes feel overwhelmed by too much information? It really is impossible to keep up with the endless scroll on our smartphones. Even if you never slept and you scrolled 24 hours a day, it never ends. You can never catch up. Type a T for too much information in the local chat if you've ever felt a bit overwhelmed by it.
Well, consider this. Too much information can be as problematic as too little. I mentioned prior to the Gutenberg Press, way back in the Dark Ages, people had very little access to information. And now we're drowning in it. In fact, some futurists predict that if we don't figure out digital archival and how to sort through all this information, we could enter the digital dark ages. We have to figure out how to deal with too much information, how to organize it, sort it, preserve it. Just within the past few months since November of 2022, we have another impact on changing literacy, the rise of artificial intelligence. It's certainly impacting literacy. Here's an AI robot for you. He's kind of cute. <laughs> AI applications are all around us. Have you tried any? Try the name of an try um, try typing the name of a generative AI app in local chat if you've tried one. Just type the name of where you tried some AI. I've tried Midjourney, Crayon, a few others. And I bet you've all tried one because Microsoft has embedded one of the generative AIs right into their Bing search engine. Yes, Dally. Okay, there's another one. Anybody tried ChatGPT? I bet some of you have. Yes, Dolly is saying ChatGTP. So it's all around us and it's becoming just prevalent to our, um, our literacy. So consider how artificial intelligence uses human product productivity to create new content. AI doesn't know anything that it hasn't learned from humans. AI has no brain, but it's, it's gathered all the information that we have uploaded or digitized since the close of the Gutenberg parentheses. And so that's a lot of information that AI already has. Are we enhancing our creativity or are we outsourcing it? I was a national writing trainer. I love get to connecting books to writing. Reading and writing are connected like breathing. Inhale, take a deep breath, that's reading. Exhale, blow it out, that's writing. In and out, in and out. I wanna write my own words. I wanna reflect and revise. And I want the next generation to learn that process. Maybe AI can help us. But here's a blog post that I thought you might read later on that I wrote about that concern. And I titled it, Will AI Slaughter the Muse? Are we giving AI a lot of our creativity outside of ourselves? You can read that later. And here's another problem in the dark side right next to me on my left. F-O-M-O, -O, FOMO. Hmm, what's that? Does anybody know what FOMO is? If you do, type out what the letters stand for. There's this anxiety that many people feel, especially teenagers, that there's something exciting or interesting happening elsewhere. And they're often aroused by the posts that they see on a social media site. And they there's just this feeling. Anybody know what it means? F-O-M-O, -O. somebody can type it in. Social media posts make it seem like something exciting is happening elsewhere. A lot of teenagers sleep with their cell phones right beside them. They're never seen without their phones because that's where real life takes place on their phones. John's almost got it. FOMO. Yes. It's fear of missing out. They got this sensation of, I'm missing it. I gotta, I gotta grab my phone, I'm missing out. Fear of missing out. It's a huge problem. There's some psychologists who are working on the, the problems. Many teenagers are suffering from the, the social media anxiety that, that has just 
overwhelmed them. Does this seem like a concern to you? Maybe some of you know young people who prefer to text rather than to speak out loud. Research has shown that social media has many harmful effects on young people, particularly teenage girls who often use photo editing apps to edit their life and their pictures. It almost becomes a competition of who has the prettiest life. It's a lot of work and a lot of harm on their, on their, uh, on their development. And here's another one that affects all of us confirmation bias. It's natural. It's just a fact of life that we all want to be around people who are like us, who think like us. <laughs> well, certainly confirmation bias is a problem that is amplified by social media, by following people who agree with us, think like we do, and are on our side of issues. We don't open up our minds to challenge our thinking. We confirm our personal beliefs rigidly. And that is not how we learn. Even though it's natural to want to be with people that we agree with, we need to be able to have conversations that are difficult. We learn in collision with the ideas of others. I got that phrase from Vygotsky, a Russian psychologist, the collision of ideas. We learn through debate of issues and perspectives. The art of debate is dying. On a debate team in high school, you used to have to have cards from both sides of an argument and you didn't even know which side you would have to argue. Now that's critical thinking. Could we do that today? We're so emotionally involved in our arguments. We need to separate our emotion and think critically. Freedom of speech, intellectual freedom, has been challenged in the media, and it's an important right for human beings. The ability to disagree yet remain respectful, that's important in both physical and virtual environments. And social media makes this difficult as we simply <laughs> swipe away any content we disagree with. We re remove or block any individual we don't agree with from our personal dashboards. And look over here to my left. What about big data? Is big data mining like Big Brother watching if you read 1984? I sometimes think that Google knows more about me than I know about myself. Our phones track our every movements. I re realized recently, even when mine's turned off, surveillance cameras watch everywhere we go. Perhaps privacy is dead. I personally often joke that it died in 2008, but maybe it's not a joke. Type a Y if you're ever concerned about your own privacy or cybersecurity or big data mining. Think of any other concerns that you may have about life in digital culture. Is, is there such a thing as internet addiction? Are our human brains changing as we oscillate through our metamodern world? And I like that Sidearm's giving us the plus to this. My husband often gives me the plus to this. He loves the same thing. Amazon knows what, what we like and gives you good suggestions about books or about the clothes. Amazon knows if, that I like to wear boots. How does it know? <laughs> we get good tips from the data mining and, and videos from YouTube. Uh, m many of our um, video streaming sites that we log into track us and they say, you liked that? Well, you'll like this. Saves us a lot of time. There are pluses and there are minuses, advantages and disadvantages to all of these elements of digital culture. I'm gonna sit over here by the cyborg.
as you're thinking about all these concerns that you have about life and digital culture, we're going to debrief in a little bit. This has just been a brief glimpse into the many issues that are emerging in metamodern times as literacy has changed. How can we remain human? Look at this cyborg. Are, are we becoming cyborgs? Will AI be better at creativity and knowledge than we are? I certainly hope not. Personally, I, I believe there's really only one way out of this digital dark room. And that is to embrace our personal responsibility for digital citizenship. If we don't, we have a rather dark future ahead. And we'll discuss this in just a few minutes. For each one of us, from the youngest child I mentioned, the youngest who watches his parents staring into their phones, to the elderly who are told when they have a health care concern, and they, they don't even have a computer, but they're told to go online for health information, all of us are digital citizens. So we're going to head over to the Community Virtual Library to debrief and to discuss about meta literacy and digital citizenship. I hope you've got the... And we have been doing this ISB course, we call it, for some time. And this picture was uh, here uh, from the last years. And now uh, we're going to probably have another picture with you guys at the end of the course. And you'll be on it. Um, this is what we're doing in this course. It's a collaborative course. Uh, we are working with... Uh, I got to lock this. I think people clicking on it. Um, a collaborative course uh, since 19, 2019. And we are working with TU Dublin and Chai University together in this course. We always have uh, Irish students and Turkish students working together in this course. And this year, uh, we have two Irish students with us and one more probably coming on the way. And we will have three students from Ireland and around 10 students from Turkey. And the other sign that you see here is the Virtual World Education Consortium. It's an organization that works here in virtual world, helping uh, educators like us who is, who is doing uh, their courses here or educating activities here. So uh, now, this year, we decided with John to join their student challenge as part of this course. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to compete against some other universities and some other uh, schools there with some other students. And as these groups that we just told you, the purple, red, and uh, yellow teams, you'll be competing against uh, other people. What you're going to do is you're going to, this is our team, by the way, and then you're going to uh, have serious simulations in the metaverse this this is the team of the project and students are challenged to build an immersive environment that demonstrate demonstrates serious learning in 3d it started already so we are working for it already and it's the closing date for this is december 2nd by on december 2nd we're go we're all going to meet here uh, in virtual world and you're going to uh, present your builds you're going to present your area that you built here in 3D, uh, which is the immersive environment. And you're going to show or teach something to the audience there. You're going to tell something to them with your build. That is your uh, main objective in this. The evaluation criteria are those five things that you see here. Authenticity, accuracy of content, balanced uh, sites without bias, uh, accessible aesthetic appeal, interaction and immersion, and presentation. Now I, I put two more slides to this one. You, you might need to zoom on that to be able to read it. It's a little bit slow and small, the forms. I just realized it now. But then uh, authenticity and accuracy 
should be apparent in your build and presentation. Where did your information come from? Citations or resources listed. Examples include accurate historical content of a particular era, authentic clothing or objects from the time, or accurate scientific language and concepts demonstrated with sources documented. So that is going to be checked when the jury is going to evaluate your final product. And the balanced without, without bias is means you have shown both sides of any concept or argument, if applicable. Examples will be showing both sides of a political issue, such as fracking or climate change. Interaction and immersion means your audience can do something. Click and interact with objects rather than just view slides. Now I'm showing you a slide. This is an example. This is one way of uh, showing things. But you might do other things in 3D immersive environment like Second Life. You might create something, a note card giver, for example. Your audience can click on the uh, note card giver and an automatic note card will be transferred to the avatar who is clicking. So it might have a, you know, detailed more information about what we are talking about. So you, you might do all those things and there are different ways to interact as well. You will see and uh, that will uh, make your 3D build uh, as interactive and immer immersive. Uh, that is one of the goals in this challenge as well. One important thing, I don't know how many of you were there on last Saturday. We had a session here. Uh, it was uh, run by Gentle Heron, a friend of ours in virtual world. And uh, she has an island called Virtual Ability Island. And she is going to do another session with you all uh, this semester. And we're going to visit her island and see what she's doing there. But uh, what she does is basically helping the disabled people to interact through this world. Uh, so there are, uh, so she, she cares a lot about the accessibility of the builds or the, a campus like that. Is it accessible for everyone? So that is what she's caring for. For example, I'm, I'm speaking out now on voice, but if you have a difficulty at hearing, let's say, you have a disab disability like that, then you would not be able to hear me clearly. What should I do? Then I should maybe add text, like subtitles to my speech. That is one thing that you could do. So she talked about this, what you could do last week. And uh, there are, this is her checklist here. Are there clear instructions for what to see or where to go in your build? And is interactivity clear to the viewer? Are objects clearly labeled? Is it easy to move around? No difficult stairways. Is signage easy to read with rotating particles? So those are the things that she is going to check on your uh, build. So that is something to keep in mind as well. And last but not least, presentation includes how you explain your content to your audience. The presentation should show the subject matter clearly using both voice and text. A good pacing of information enhances the build. Those are the tips for you when you're going to do that building. OK, um, this is pretty much what you're going to work on in this course. And I tried to summarize it as much as I could. And I'm going to leave this slide.